Hello, my name is Ivo Potov. In this video, we will talk about the design of heating and cooling grids and their role in future-proof integrated energy systems. The learning objectives of this video include a short historic overview of existing heating and cooling grids and the differences between these generations of heating and cooling grids. Then we look at the major challenges to decarbonize the heating cooling supply and finally we will look at the future research directions in this field. Heating and cooling grids have been developed since the late 19th century. The main purpose of these grids is to distribute thermal energy from sources to customers via a network of pressurized pipes with supply and return lines. Initially these were steam grids with supply temperatures around 200 degrees Celsius. In the second generation grids these temperatures dropped significantly and hot water was used with a centralized combined heat and power plant with one directional supply to the buildings. In the third generation grids, which are typical for most of the existing large scale heat grids, we see that multiple large scale heat sources are being applied, such as industrial waste heat, centralized biomass boilers, CHP plants for the district heating grids. Temperatures are still typically well above 70 degrees Celsius. Coming to fourth generation grids, which were introduced around two decades ago, we see the introduction of more renewable sources, geothermal energy sources and other low-grade waste heat sources. As a result, the temperature further drops in fourth generation grids. However, a big challenge is appearing when we shift to the so-called fifth generation grids. This is because the temperatures are further going, going down and it is becoming feasible to combine both heating and cooling in the same grid. This means that the heat supply needs to be upgraded at the individual building level using heat pumps and electricity. We will focus on the differences between these, the existing and future grids in the next slides. In the third generation heating grids, the supply temperatures are still high in the range of 80 to 120 degrees Celsius. They require centralized circulation pumps for heat distribution. Further, since the supply and return temperatures are high, the exact value of the return temperature is less relevant as heat sources such as gas-fired boilers can produce any temperature that is required. In a fourth generation grid, there are more medium temperature sources available. Hence the return temperature is reduced and becomes more relevant. Also centralized circulation pumps are still required in fourth generation grids. Hence in terms of controllability and design of the grid, the fourth generation and third generation grids are still very similar. But the differences really appear when we go to fifth generation because then individual buildings may use cooling from the grid, which means they automatically provide heating. This makes the return temperature a key performance indicator. Another significant difference is the use of circulation pumps at the individual building level. The building may extract from the warm and cold line as per requirement, and therefore centralized circulation pumps are not required anymore. This allows bidirectional flow of heat between these sources. So the fifth generation grid can supply both heating and cooling simultaneously and is characterized by an innovative design concept as compared to earlier generations of the grids. Four disciplines are required for the design of district heating cooling grids and these need to be considered simultaneously. The following design considerations do apply to all district heating uh, generations. First, the hydraulic design, which uses criteria for maximum steady state pressure, pressure gradients, and it results in pipe diameters and the sizing of pumps and valves and surge mitigation measures. The thermal design, second design uh, criterion, uses criteria for the design, temperature, and admissible heat loss in a network and leads to a selection of the pipe material, insulation class and the sizing of expansion vessels. The structural design determines the thermal expansion 
soil pipe interaction, which results in the choice of pipe material, the installation method, and the installation and necessity of expansion cushions. Finally, the fourth um, design criterion, the control design, aims for safe, stable and efficient operation of the district heating cooling grid and results in the operational control philosophy that details how pumps and valves will be operated. Each district heating cooling generation has its own specific design considerations. An existing third generation grid, for example, needs to transform from high temperature to medium temperature levels. This requires efforts to reduce the return temperatures in all connected buildings such that the supply temperatures can be reduced as well. These lower temperatures enable the integration of renewable sources like geothermal energy. One of the challenges in the fourth generation district heating grids includes the integration of smart solutions. Incentives like variable tariffs can be implemented to reduce the peak demand and minimize the use of peak boilers. Since heat storage is very cheap compared to electricity storage, heat storage tanks can be charged using heat pumps or even electric heaters while balancing the power grid at the same time. This is one example of power to heat integration. The novel fifth generation grids are most advanced. Therefore, more attention must be paid to the design of all control systems at the building level and the network level. The return temperature has become a key performance indicator and multiple power to heat solutions can be implemented. The next lecture will detail different control strategies for future-proof district heating cooling systems. In conclusion, we have talked about the generations of district heating and district heating cooling grids and highlighted differences between these generations. We have identified the four disciplines that are required for the design of district heating cooling grids. And finally, we have listed key design considerations for future-proof district heating and district heating cooling grids. That concludes this lecture. Thank you for your attention.